each one of these groups. So this is the first one which we are having, a Standing Committee on Trade and Marketing. And uh, to conduct the session, I'd like to invite on stage Ms. Anke Van den Haag. Thank you, Anke. Um, most of the people here, if I tell anything about her, uh, I won't be adding anything new to the knowledge which you already have about her. Uh, I can only say that she is the deputy director with Plantum, which is the Dutch Seed Association. And uh, she is a renowned and respected authority on particularly on issues related to uh, um, IPR and biodiversity and the trade related issues in the international sea trade. She has also served on the executive committee of APSA uh, for a long time uh, and uh, the APSA has greatly benefited not only from her experience uh, which uh, she brings in from the plantum but also from her own personal expertise in the areas of IPR and the trade. Uh, so we are very happy that she accepted our request because uh, both the chair and the co-chair for this group, whose name you will uh, find in the delegate book, they had to cancel their uh, participation at the last moment for certain reasons. Uh, so we requested Anke with her experience. She has earlier also served in the trade and marketing uh, committee uh, of APSA earlier. So I'm very happy that she accepted our request and she's here to guide us during this session. Th thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, welcome ladies and gentlemen. And as you see, we are in a big room, so people who are sitting in the back, don't hesitate to come a little bit forward. That is nice for the speakers. Uh, you can't hear me? So it's better? You, you are my signal there, I see. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome here. And as indicated before, Please come a bit forward. We have a big room and it's good for the speakers and, and also later for the panelists that you are a bit closer to the, to the podium. Um, so, as uh, Dr. Dautlani already indicated, Mr. Naranjan, Niranjan Kolipari and Dr. Duhu Ma are not present, so they asked me at the last moment to fill in. So, I'm very pleased to do so. Um, it's not my specialty, this topic, and I know there are a lot of specialists in the room, so please come with your experiences uh, and share that with us during the presentations and the panel. Trade and marketing, it's an important topic. It becomes even more and more important with all the aspirations that many countries and therefore also many companies have to export more and more seeds. So it's on the one hand good to gain more knowledge on trade opportunities and on the other hand to know what needs to be done to export the seeds in an appropriate manner. Therefore, phytosanitary measures and how to deal with those has, has been at heart of this standing committee. In today's session, we are first going to look at the opportunities for seed business here in Thailand and secondly, we are going to look at the implications of the international standard for phytosanitary measures 38 uh, on the seed sector. So I would suggest uh, that we really start uh, with the session. So I would like to call upon uh, Mr. David Calacor. He is going to give us a presentation with the opportunities for seed industry in Thailand. 
Mr. David Kalliker has worked within the industry for 27 years in field crops within the APAC region as well as South America and has developed a wide range of skill. In his present role as a group sales and marketing manager Southeast Asia at Seed Asia Limigrant Group, he is responsible for sales and marketing of corn and hybrid rice for Southeast Asia and other export countries. He has many achievements, including 20 years with Advanta, with various roles in Australia and Asia. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, can, you can all hear me? Come on, just. That's better. Greetings, welcome, and uh, and thank you to the um, Thai, Seed, Thai Seed Trade Association and APSA for asking me to present to you here this afternoon. Opportunities, and I've thrown in there another word, and threats for the Thailand seed industry. It's not only the um, the opportunities for the for the companies within Thailand, but it's also the opportunities for other companies to come and participate in Thailand as well. Opportunity, if we define opportunity, it's a situation or a condition favourable for an attainment of a goal. So that's basically what we're going to be talking about today. Just to cover off on Thailand, Thailand is the world's seventh, 17th largest manufacturer of output, the 28th largest exporter in the world, 24th largest economy by purchasing power, and it's the second largest economy in ASEAN. So ASEAN, we're talking about Vietnam, Myanmar, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, Laos, and Brunei. Basically, the ASEAN region is uh, 622 million people, just to put that into perspective. Some of the things I want to raise today, the opportunities in Thailand and for other countries and companies to come to Thailand, is things like seed health, technology, which is very important to us. Hybrid rice is an area, I think, that is an opportunity, although a very um, sensitive subject, particularly in Thailand, because it is such a protected industry. The jasmine rice industry in Thailand is Thailand's biggest export. Last week, Thailand rice was voted the number one rice in the world for quality. Cambodia was number two. That was voted by chefs from around the world at a conference in um, Macau. So I'll park the hybrid rice. I think it is, it is an opportunity one day, but uh, a very protected industry in Thailand. GMOs and traits. I've been coming to APSA for quite a number of years now, um, probably 10 years. And GMOs and traits have been talked about at various sessions. And yes, there's an opportunity. We just need to define what they are and the benefits um, that they bring. UPOV was mentioned this morning, which was good to hear. The protection of the efforts by research companies and the amount that, of money that research companies invest in Thailand can strongly be determined by the protection for, of the UPOV Convention. And the other thing that uh, we'll, we'll briefly talk about is the unionisation of phytosanitary um, requirements, particularly within the region. And Note that that's going to be talked about later in the session. So just to put things into perspective, the imports into Thailand largely consist of vegetable seed. This is just seed. Um, so vegetables, they, we have a small amount of corn, sweet corn, sorghum, etc. Um, but mainly comes down to a vegetable seed. And more importantly, for Thailand in particular is the exports. So we have, um, interesting that ochre is number one, well, that's up there is the number one import and, and export, although not by necessarily by value. Um, from my experience, the amount of exports that we have from Thailand um, is extremely large. 
in both corn, for example, and vegetable seed. We export to countries including Vietnam, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Cambodia, parts of South Africa, South America, but it's not restricted to those. It's also parts of Europe, um, parts of North America, and you know, it is a huge industry um, here in Thailand. We import some vegetables and field crops, as said. We have multiple seed companies here that invest in research, which is, is really great to see, um, particularly in vegetables and field crops. We have great facilities for seed processing, seed treatments, etc., which is extremely important, providing a, a quality product to our markets. And commodity-wise, we're also a major exporter of rice, as I said, jasmine rice, the largest export market for Thailand, cassava, sugar, sweet corn and baby corn. So you know, Thailand is the largest exporter of processed sweet corn, is the largest exporter of processed baby corn in cans in the world. And we have the enacted PVP law, 1999. So Thailand is in a unique position to help produce what we need whilst maintaining sustainability for our farming community and industry. So if we put it in to um, go back in history, the, the Thai government and the royal family in particular have been extremely instrumental in maintaining and promoting the sustainability of the farming industry in Thailand. Very supportive. Um, there has been promotion of uh, organic, the parts of the organic industry, as well as having um, incentives for companies to come in here through the Board of Investment and other avenues. So they're very, very positive in, in helping to bring research, sustainability and improved productivity to the country. Thailand. We're in this unique position to produce um, a lot of these commodities, to be a, a centre for research, because we have an exceptional climate. We have essentially an early and a late wet season. We have a dry season. We have varied temperatures um, across Thailand from the north to the south. You know, essentially in the, in the north, we, we do have a winter season um, of sorts. It gets down to 12 degrees sometimes. But, you know, we have a great climate to produce seed and other commodities throughout the year. We have great rainfall. We've got good availability of water. We have diverse growing regions. We've got upland areas, we've got lowland areas, um, and so we can grow most crops throughout the year across the country. We're an established producer here in Thailand of domestic and export needs. And uh, as I touched upon before, it really is an attractive country to do business. Many years ago at APSA, probably 10 years ago, I saw a slide very similar to this. By the year 2050, we will need to feed to a billion or more people. The question was, how are we going to do that? So nine, we're going to be up to 9 billion people 2050. That's a problem. Or is it a problem? It's an opportunity. It's something that we need to um, strive for. Much of this growth is going to come from Asia and Africa. There's no denying that. So I think Thailand is at, at the real centre to be able to um, take advantage where we can help bring research um, and you know, new varieties, be it field crop or vegetable, to help feed the world. So the whole food requirement, global demand, agricultural crops is going to rise um, given that growth in population. As an industry, if we're going to meet these demands, we need to become more efficient in our production 
whilst developing the crops that be can be grown in areas the world, uh, around the world that were previously unavailable to us. We need to look at drought tolerance. We need to look at arid, arid environments. We need to, we can't grow, we can't necessarily increase um, the growing areas where we currently are. We need to look at new areas. We need to look at increasing productivity. So we know we're going to have 9 billion plus global population and the estimates are that we're going to need about 60% increased um, food production by that year 2050. So the sensitive topic of traits in Thailand, and, and firstly I'm just going to touch on the traditional traits that we talk about in field crops, typically the glyphosate resistance, BT resistance. Um, in my opinion, my humble opinion, Thailand will probably be the last place that really does approve the use of these traits. I think we have to understand what is the real benefit of these traits to the industry. Will the farmer see a real benefit? Will it increase our production? Glyphosate resistance, great, we see extra weed control. Um, possibly improved yields through the farming practices and improved sustainability maybe. We might see a reduced use of pesticide in some crops um, and re reduced damage to product. But I think we've also got to look at some of the export markets to where we send seed because we could limit our ability to export to certain markets that don't have traits approved. Some of those markets be Sri Lanka, some parts of South Africa, some parts of South America, not all. Um, where they don't accept trade products. When we start producing traded products here, it's a very slippery slope. Um, some of the other cons are, I think, we'll be looking at limitations of export of our commodity markets, and Japan is probably a good example. We do export a lot of corn and, and other products from here, so what will that do to the exports of our commodities? Just the questions that need to be raised. I need to point out here that I am not against traits in any way, shape or form. I think in, in many areas they have a distinct advantage and it's in those areas that they need to be utilised. But that is not necessarily in every market. Research companies traditionally, I think, tended to work um, alone, in isolation of each other. and. This particular extract came from uh, an article in Hort News, September 2016. And I think it's a, it's a very good example of what can be attained, can be achieved by some of the research companies working together for the greater good, be it themselves, but also the markets in which we're operating. So two rather large companies, Syngenta and Rick Juan. In 2016, signed a cross-licensing agreement on native traits. And I think that's where we need to distinguish between the traits in which we're talking about. So they signed this agreement on native traits in vegetables. This agreement enables both of the companies to enhance their innovation capabilities and provide real future benefits to growers and consumers through the faster introduction of improved varieties. I'm not here to promote those two companies, but what I found very interesting was that some of these companies can work together to bring higher production, better improved varieties to the market by combining their resources. The signing of this agreement was a direct result of the dialogues that led to the foundation of the International Licensing Platform, the ILP, of which both of those companies are founding members. So it gives members access to patents on native traits under fair and reasonable conditions. And it currently has 12 members. Um, and is open for many other, any other seed companies to be part of. 
And I think it's initiatives like this that really enable the industry in Thailand and other countries to make a real difference going, going forward. So traits in Thailand, um, you know, we can utilise all the traits to improve performance and yield, storability, particularly in the case of vegetables and end use performance, marketability, etc. And I think there are some real opportunities here. There are, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a, a, lot of, a lot of research to be done. There's a lot of money to be invested, but in particular areas of drought resistance, heat resistance, um, salt tolerance, drought tolerance, as I said, taste and appearance, and even nutrient efficiency. Some of the other opportunities uh, in Thailand. Thailand is a real base for seed production of both field crops and vegetables. Within the tropical regions of the world, this is an ideal part, it's an ideal country um, within the region where we can produce seed at a competitive cost at high quality year round. I think, and I, well, I truly believe, and I, I know some companies have already done it, but they've used Thailand as their centre of excellence for their breeding programs in trop well, tr tropical breeding programs. Um, in particular in the areas of field corn, sweet corn and, um, and vegetables. Thailand as a country uh, has a, an agenda to develop its position as a seed hub. They want to attract new investors from the seed industry for the benefit of Thailand farmers and the export markets. They want to promote the capacity building, breeding, QA, seed treatments, technology. But we need to have PVP, um, the regulations surrounding the PVP improved so that we can take advantage of the resources and the infrastructure that we have in the country. And that's a, it's a, it's a very important point. Um, I, from personal experience, you know, we have a lot of work that goes into research in field crops, but there's also a number of small companies in um, the north of Thailand that um, are called various terms, but it's essentially copied seed that is sold at um, an extremely discounted rate or is taken into other neighbouring countries and makes it uh, very hard to compete with. Um, and we really need to look at the regulations surrounding our PV, PVP to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, UPOLF was mentioned this morning at the opening ceremony. And I think it's going to be, a, by the sound of it, a, um, a discussion that we're going to hear a lot during this seminar, during this conference. UPOLV clarifies that its mission is to provide and promote an effective system of plant variety protection with the aim of encouraging the development of new varieties of plants for the benefit of society. We need to make sure that Thailand is part of the UPOLV convention to bring in greater investment in research for the benefit of the region. It's pretty widely known, the introduction of UPOV um, and its plant protection has found that associated with that, we get increased breeding activities. We get greater avail availability of improved varieties as a result. Um, we get diversification of the types of breeders that come in. We've got in, increased spending in government programs, funding of government programs, greater investment from private, private areas as well. It encourages the development of new industry competitiveness in other foreign markets and it improves the access um, of foreign plant varieties and enhanced domestic breeding programs. It shows a commitment by the policy makers to the seed industry within the country. And I think we need that commitment within Thailand to bring the real opportunities to the front. With the 
UPOV Convention, it's a harmonised IPR system based on the 1991 Act of the UPOV Convention. It will encourage the countries around Asia and the Pacific region to continuously deliver innovative genetics. That's it in a nutshell. And if we can do that, if we can have Thailand to be part of that UPOV Convention, I think we'll see a lot more spending here. We'll see a lot more come out of the breeding programs. You'll see a lot more private enterprise increase their investment to get a greater return for them and for the end user. I think it's a necessary step. It, um, it's something we really need to, uh, to put in place here. Briefly, um, I think we're going to be talking about PVP, or the, sorry, the phytosanitary requirements within the region as well. So I think we need to have a unionisation of our phytosanitary requirements within the region with which we import and export from. From personal experience, again, um, we have some diverse requirements to export to different countries and it makes it extremely hard sometimes. Um, you know, Sri Lanka is extremely hard to fulfil corn and it's a market that's around about a thousand tonne now and looks like increasing to probably about 1,600 tonne because of their increased demand, because of their need to be self-sustainable in corn production. They're feeding more chickens, they're feeding more beef, they're trying to produce more milk. They need corn to do that. Yet there are so many barriers in getting hybrids into that country. That's just one example. We have other examples as well. So I think if we can, uh, as an industry, work on those um, unionisation of the phytosanitary re requirements, it would make um, things a lot easier. One of the last points that I'm reasonably passionate about is Within our industry, particularly if we look in, in APSA, for example, if we look at the companies that operate within the region, we tend to see the same faces every year. When we come to APSA, it's, 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 the demographic is, is middle-aged, like myself, and, um, and every year we're getting older. There are some companies that are, that are working towards this to really encourage the youth to join the industry. You know, youth will bring innovation. It will bring different ideas. But to make sure that this industry, not only within Thailand, but within all of the countries that we operate in, we need to encourage graduates from university. We need to encourage students to go to university to start study agriculture. We need to encourage that. We also need to encourage those graduates to come into the seed industry. And I think that is something that is extremely important industry-wide and that it will bring a lot of benefits and sustainability to our industry. And I think that's a, that's, for me, that's a, that's a very important point. That's the end of my presentation, Ankar. Um, thank you very much. And um, I hope that brought a, a different perspective to um, the Thailand seed industry for you all. Thank you. So are there any questions uh, for David? I have Francois here. Please uh, say your name and the organization where you are from. Uh, <coughs> François Biogo from GNIS. Uh, th thanks for this presentation. Um, I have four short questions. <laughs> First, uh, you talk about hybrid rice and you said that maybe it will be a situation for development will be better in some years. Uh, but I heard that hybrid rice is decreasing in Vietnam, even in Vietnam was never re really favorable to that. I heard also some problem in China. So uh, do you think that hybrid rice is really uh, 
uh, some improvement, uh, technical improvement. Second question is about the uh, UPOV uh, uh, and the government. You, you, repeat, you repeated that, uh, as it was said this morning, that you, you think there is a real commitment of a government, but actually the government is observer in UPOV for more than 10 years now. So, uh, and as soon as, as far as I know, they, they, they didn't send a, a new law to UPOV uh, to, to ask that uh, confirmation that it's in line with UPOV. So, on which signal uh, you are so sure to say uh, now there is something stronger on, on that? Can I, just, uh, and can I just stop there? Because so, I want to keep those two questions in mind and answer them to the best of my ability, and then we'll go to the next two, okay? Hybrid rice, you are correct. Hybrid rice has been focusing on increased yield. What hybrid rice needs to concentrate, what we need to focus on is improved quality as well. There has been, in various countries around the region, um, the testing and release of hybrid rice varieties what they tended to do in many situations was ignore the quality. The quality was not there, even though there was a benefit to, um, to yield. And it's also a re-education process for rice farmers who's been growing, doing the same thing for generations upon generations, thousands of years effectively. So in some instances in, in India and Bangladesh and some export varieties, in um, Myanmar, there has actually been an increase in the volume of hybrid rice being grown. Where it fits a particular market, it will be very difficult to do that until we increase the quality of hybrid rice varieties, particularly for Thailand. Uh, so it really comes down to quality. UPOV, I didn't actually say that Thailand was indicating a, uh, a move away from where they've been traditionally. What I did so is they need to. We need the Thailand government to get up and do more with relation to you, Paul. And my last question is about uh, EEC. Uh, you know the government of Thailand, uh, but not for, for seed or agriculture, but generally, uh, is insisted a lot about the Eastern Economic Corridor and I, I would like to know if you heard anything regarding the place of agriculture uh, in, in this project of uh, Eastern Economic Corridor. No. I'm not sure I clearly get the question. Can you just clarify that again? Yeah, the, the government of Thailand, in, in all the high-level uh, discussion with foreign countries is uh, focusing on the Eastern Economic Corridor, EEC. And my question, uh, but more generally on industry services, and I would like to know if you heard something about the place of agriculture in this project of Thailand uh, uh, really. 4.0. Not personally, no. Okay, thank you both. Are there any other questions in the room? I have here one in the front. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your nice presentation. My name is Ora from uh, Kassasad University. The last point you mentioned was about uh, getting the younger generation involved in the seed industry and also in agriculture. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think Thailand is kind of lacking human resources, particularly scientists, in, uh, in agriculture or in the seed uh, technology, as well as uh, marketing and an economist. Um, I want to see your perspective from multinational companies that wanted to invest in uh, Thailand, and also perhaps taking over some of the companies like Seed Asia that Limagen has, has done. Do you see opportunities or maybe strengths of the seed industry in Thailand? I think various countries I've worked in 
we all we all share a common problem. Um, the youth around the world uh, didn't find agriculture to be particularly attractive. It wasn't sexy. Okay, it's um, it, it didn't have a good impression on the youth. There has been programs recently, um, graduate programs conducted by NGOs, conducted by private enterprise to try and change that, to give the youth coming out of universities experience in other countries around Asia, around um, APAC region in particular, and slowly, I think the perception of the agricultural industry is changing. It is becoming more attractive to graduates. They see the benefit of agriculture. It is evolving into a more attractive market. Um, for, you know, in the company I'm with here in Thailand, um, personally, within the area that I am, I am encouraging that we promote within and we are recruiting people from the bottom level up. We try and recruit, train, incentivize people from university to come up within the ranks. Um, so, and I personally, I think that's, um, that's where I came from. Um, it's the way I worked through uh, the industry in my career is, is I started off in the field and, and worked my way through and I've been in agriculture. I've been in the seed industry most of my life. But um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. It's, you know, it, we need to, to take on board the ideas and the innovation that the youth bring through. Technology has changed so much, you know, the, 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 whether it's the drones, whether it's the robot sprayers out there, the technology that's coming through, yield mapping, the, the technology is there, is not going to be adopted at the same rate by the people, particularly in this room, if you like, okay? We don't understand it as well as the graduates of university. They bring with them innovation, they bring with them ideas, and they will help the industry change and evolve. Does that help answer? Thank yes, you. Yes, maybe let me rephrase my question. Uh, I'm talking about uh, multinational companies that may want to invest in Thailand. Why the situation that we may have not, we may not have that strength of human resources or other resources. So I mentioned whether you see the potentials of small or medium companies like Seed Asia. Um, to emerge in the country and so that there might be collaboration or maybe joint ventures? Yes, there's a lot of room for collaboration. So, you know, we mentioned multinationals and, and you mentioned multinationals and small companies. Um, I think that a lot of the small companies rely on the innovation of the multinationals. It's very hard for some of the small companies to grow at the same rate at which they did 20 to 30 years ago. Because a lot of the money, a lot of the small companies have been absorbed by the multinationals. But I do think that also a lot of the multinationals are taking on board the idea of bringing the youth in and bringing them up um, through the industry. And I'll name them again, and I'm, I'm not in any way associated with Syngenta, okay? Syngenta has a fantastic graduate program. Every year they adopt, they, they have um, applicants from various universities within ASEAN and they take them to different countries to study agriculture in that country. It's a, it's a two to three week um, field tour and it could be in Australia, it could be in Vietnam, it could be in Myanmar. They do that, I think it's in conjunction with US aid, I think, um, and a number of other parties, but they in particular have really taken hold of the idea of taking youth from university and taking them into the market. And then they bring them into the organisation. 
All right? They offer them opportunities, not only within Thailand, for example, but within other countries of the region to work within their own organisation, oh. if they so choose. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Uh, time is up. So I think we have to move uh, forward to the next point on the agenda, and that is a round table discussion on the ISPM 38. Uh, let me first ask uh, to the podium uh, Dennis Johnson. He is going to be the moderator of the panel discussion. And uh, Dennis Johnson is currently working at the International Seed Federation as the seed health manager responsible for supporting the phytosanitary committee as well as the seed applied technologies committee. Originally based in California, uh, Dennis has 15 years of experience working for a multinational seed company where he held various roles contributing to the development of the company's genetic quality and seed health laboratory testing programs prior to relocating to the ISF office in Lyon, Switzerland. Um, Dennis will give in a minute uh, some introductionary remarks on the ISPM 38, but I'm already calling upon the people to come to the floor, uh, Dennis. So we have uh, several panelists, and the first one I would like to ask to come to the podium is Mr. ASN Reddy. Um, Mr. ASN Reddy is presently the CEO of Delta AgriGenetics in Hyderabad. He's a seed professional with more than three decades of multifunctional skills and leadership experience with diverse verticals of the seed industry, like seed production, quality assurance, seed processing, seed technology, logistics, uh, and management. He's a postgraduate in seed science and technology. Um, Mr. Reddy is a dynamic seed entrepreneur. He is a past general secretary and president of the Seedsmen Association in Hyderabad, the oldest regional seed association in the country, and also past general secretary of National Seed Association of India. The next one I would like to ask to the floor is Mr. Liang Sang. Um, Mr. Liang Sang is currently the manager of the R&D Center of Yuan Long Pinghai Tech Agriculture Co. Limited in China, a large uh, agriculture conglomerate including several leading seed companies of China. He is a postgraduate with several years of experience working with the industry. He has been an examiner in the Office of Plant Variety Protection in the Ministry of Agriculture in China a member of the intellectual and is a member of the intellectual property committee of ISEF. In his present assignment, he is engaged in analysis of strategic information about the market, competitors, R&D policies, IP, and GM safety management and variety registration. So welcome. The next one I would like to ask to the podium is Mr. Toyuharu Fukuda. He is Senior Managing Director of the Japan Sea Trade Association. He um, assumed the position in June 2015. Prior to joining uh, JASTA, he held the senior, senior Management position in the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries in Japan. He was a Director of Seed and Seedling D Division, the Director of the Plant Protection Division, Director of Fruit and Flower, and Director of Horticultural Products. When he acted as Director of Plant Protection Division in the Ministry, he was in charge of WTO dispute on phytosanitary measures uh, complained by the United States. He majored in plant pathology in the University of Tokyo and graduated in 1978. Then I have um, Dr. Gabriel Ortega Romero. He is the regulatory and scientific affairs lead for Monsanto into the in, in the Philippines. Before he worked uh, with Monsanto, he worked in the Department uh, of Agriculture in the Philippines for more than 20 years. He is a board member of the Philippine Seed Industry Association and uh, he holds a PhD in genetics of the UC Davis.
Uh, you see in the program also Radvi Rati, but unfortunately he couldn't come. So this is the panel, I think, a large panel. And I would like to give the floor to you, Dennis, to give an introduction. Thank you, Anka. So to begin um, my talk about the ISBM 38 and an introduction to it, I'd like to ask everyone just by a show of hand who's familiar with the ISPM 38. Okay, great. Then it looks like uh, a lot of you are in the right spot this afternoon. So what you'll find in the phytosanitary area is that we have a habit of using a lot of acronyms. And so you'll hear a lot about the, a lot of those today. And, uh, but I'll walk you through them and we'll see what we can do. But you'll see when I say ISPM 38, it kind of gives as much information if I'm to say the International Standard for Phytosanitary Measures 38 on the International Movement of Seed. Okay, both are just as intriguing, right? And so if I'm to start on the ISPM 38, I need to talk to you about the IPPC, which is the International Plant Protection Convention. Uh, the purpose of this convention that uh, currently has 183 contracting members is to prevent the introduction, establishment, and spread of plant pests. Uh, it does this through the, the CPM, or the Commission on Phytosanitary Measures. And so how does the CPM, or the IPPC, do, IPPC do this? By providing guidelines to countries on how to prevent the introduction, establishment, and spread. They adopt these guidelines, and they're called ISPMs, or these International Standards for Phytosanitary Measures. Uh, so, if we now talk about the ISPM 38, it's basically the 38th set of guidelines that the IPPC has adopted, and it was adopted this year in April. And so, we have interest in this particular uh, standard in the seed industries because it's specific for seed. And it creates opportunities for the seed industry, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about some of the elements of the ISPM 38 to illustrate that for you. For example, the ISPM 38 talks about a PRA, or a pest risk analysis. A PRA was described earlier in, in some guidelines provided by the IPPC, but now it's, it's, it's in the, the focus specifically on seed. So it adds a bit more clarity on PRAs for seed, and also further opportunities for the seed industry. So what is a PRA? It's a PRA is, is methodology put in place to enable the, a country or the country's NPPO, National Plant Protection Organization, to establish a phytosanitary framework, or, or sorry, to establish phytosanitary measures for a particular pest. And so there's three steps to a PRA. The first step is to identify the pest and establish a, or, or confirm that there's a pathway for the introduction of this pest into the importing country. PRAs earlier described were for all plants, plant products, as, as well as seed. But now this is specific for seed. So now this guidance to NPPOs is that we must demonstrate that, that seed is a pathway for that pest to be introduced into the country. And if that is established, uh, that seed can be a pathway, you then go to the second step of the PRA. If, on the other hand, you find that seed is not a pathway, then you would stop at the first step and no phytosanitary measure is required. But let's say you go to that second step. Second step is on the assessment, uh, the risk assessment on the ability of that pest once introduced to be established and spread, as well as cause economic and or environmental impacts. So uh, again, this is the second stage, and so you can stop at this step also. If, if it's evaluated that the, the, there's, there's little to no chance to being established or that there's no economic or environmental impact, no phytosanitary measure is needed. But if so, and if there's some level of risk that needs to be managed, it goes to the third step, which is to apply phytosanitary measures appropriate to that risk that was identified. So what does this mean? Well, with the ISPM 38, these NPPOs are now working to implement this standard. And so you can imagine a conversation between national seed associations and the, the NPPO that's doing the implementation and, and discussing this new PRA on, on seed, specific to seed concept. And so if the NPPO comes with a list of regulated pests, 
The National Seed Association can come with the ISF regulated pest list. What this regulated pest list is, is it has a list of all regulated pests anywhere in the globe for, for each crop, along with a designation of whether or not seed is a pathway. Along with that comes all of the scientific data and, and research papers that justify that designation of whether seed is a pathway or not. So what you'll find is that when, when this conversation occurs, there's likely to be some regulated pests that the ISF regulated pest list will show that seed is not a pathway. It's at that point that the National Seed Association can provide all of that research and data that provides a really good technical justification that that regulated pest should probably be deregulated. One other example would be the, the, the concept of a purpose of import. So this new ISPM 38 provides guidance to NPPOs to say really consider the purpose of import when you're doing your, your PRA and establishing phytosanitary measures. So for example, you can imagine seed that's crossing a border. That's the intention is to go to a laboratory for seed testing where that seed is destroyed. Well, for, if you think about that second step in the PRA that we talked about, it's what's the likelihood that for, for something to be established and spread. Well, if the seed is coming into a laboratory and destroyed, there's little or no risk for that pest to establish in the country, right? You can compare that with, for example, an op open field planting of the seed, which, would ha which may have a bit more risk. So then if, you, if you understand that concept there, then you move to that third step of applying a f an, an appropriate phytosanitary measure. Well, if you have little to no risk versus some more risk, tendency is that w in the regulations in place now is it's the same phytosanitary measure. So that opens up another discussion for national seed associations to have with their NPPO about wh where w these instances such as, such as the, the lab testing, perhaps we need a, a phytosanitary measure in place that's a little less trade restrictive, okay? So, so hopefully that gives a little bit more insight into the ISPM 38, very quick. We don't have time to go through all of it, of course. But there is a, we, we've developed at ISF uh, an ISPM 38 training manual that's available online. And so you can access that on the ISF website. There's a, a position papers and then within that technical papers and you'll find it. So that describes a little bit more about these concepts that, uh, that I introduced today. But I think it's more important for us to get to the the panel at this point and learn about what the, the National Seed Associations are doing in this area of ISPM 38. So uh, Dr. Romero, maybe I can start with you and then we'll move along the, the panel here. But uh, I think the first question that would be interesting for the group today is maybe you can share a bit about uh, your National Seed Association and what, uh, what the awareness is uh, at the association as well as the membership and maybe a bit of what activities are, are, are planned in response to this adoption by ISPM 38. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dennis. So PSIA is the Philippine Seed Industry Association of the Philippines. And uh, as to ISPM 38, um, uh, just at the outset, I'm uh, relatively a beginner in, the, in my participation at uh, PSIA. So I would say that as far as I, ISPM 38 is concerned, uh, there is no structured or well-planned well education program on ISPM so far at PSIA. Uh, I think only a handful who have attended international workshops or meetings are aware. Although in the monthly meetings of PSIA, uh, there are brief, brief reports uh, on the meeting highlights that are shared uh, to, the, to the members. Uh, there is uh, awareness, but uh, at this point, it's low, low uh, level of awareness because of the absence of uh, uh, a structured and conscious uh, education program. Oh, that's on the first question. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Zhang, if you can share. Mm. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as everyone here knows that China is uh, a huge and the second market, uh, seed market in the world, just after America. Uh, most uh, international seed companies uh, have been in China for many years. 
uh, and uh, develop, and uh, the companies, uh, uh, the international seed companies uh, in China developed very well for. <coughs> uh, now, uh, some seed companies from China are entering the international seed market. Uh, uh, this uh, company is uh, most focused uh, on hybrid rice and uh, vegetable seed. Uh, so, uh, import and export of, uh, of uh, commercial seeds and gemplasm for R&D uh, are becoming more and more uh, fre fre frequent for China. Uh, some experts uh, from China recommended by uh, China National Seed Association uh, have taken part in the uh, development of ISB uh, 38. And uh, the Chinese government uh, has established a relatively complete uh, fitter, um, uh, fighter sanitary system uh, for seed import and export. Uh, this is not a uh, this is not the own. This is not only the need for development of country seed industry, uh, but also the need for promoting the development of international seed uh, industry. So, the uh, implementation of ISM, ISPM 38 is an important milestone for international seed market, and. And the China National Seed Association will coordinate, or coordinate the implementation of ISF, ISPM 38. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. So it looks like uh, in the Philippines as well as China, we do have um, you know additional outreach opportunities there, and, uh, and there, there's there's discussion and, and and focus that this could be uh, an area for, for further pursuit. Um, and for, for next, uh, Mr. Fukuda, if you can let me know a bit about the, the awareness in your, your area and, uh, and maybe uh, efforts toward uh, assisting with the implementation. Thank you, Mr. Jinsong. I would like to explain uh, Japan Seed Trade Association's activity on ISPM 38. Uh, in February nine, uh, 2015, I wrote an article on draft ISPM. At that time, uh, ISPM 38 was draft ISPM, International Movement of Seed. And uh, just placed it in the rating of the association and published it. Then, uh, just took opportunities such as international committee meeting or the board of directors meeting to explain the draft SPM. Japanese NPPO is Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries. We call them MAF. Uh, they held domestic stakeholders uh, committee meeting to correct opinions about uh, the, the draft ISPM. And uh, from JASTA, uh, Mr. Madoka Koshibe uh, participated as a representative. And JASTA had uh, several meetings with Mark officials to follow up the draft ISPM. After these meetings, just shared information with just member companies by emails. When uh, ISPM 38 was uh, adopted at CPM 12 last April, just shared this information from MAF with uh, just members. Can, can you use the mic? A close, can come closer to the mic. I think it's hard Sorry. to hear you. In addition, 
The briefing session by MAF attendants was held after their return from CPM12 and just share this report also with our members. Thank you. <laughs> That's my answer. Okay, thank you for that. And Lester, Mr. Reddy, if you can share. Yeah, good evening. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Seed Association in India, we had a discussion with uh, government officials like uh, Directorate of Plant uh, Protection Quarantine on this ISPM 38, which is a new thing. And they asked us to discuss with uh, NIPHM, which is uh, National Institute of uh, Plant Health Management. We had a discussion on what areas we need to focus uh, in regarding ISPM 38. The areas we are going to focus is uh, seeds as pest, weed risk assessment, and domestic quarantine, seed health testing, systems approach, SOPs for export of seeds, and we also requested uh, to uh, authorize the institute for seed health testing to, from the government of India. And also possibilities to enhance seed trade. Uh, the areas for uh, one is enhance its role in international standards setting and developing national SPS standards more and more in line with international standards and uh, strengthening accreditation and certification systems in India and also effective communication through national inquiry points, which is a good, uh, it's there in the website, we can interact through this. And also effective implementation of domestic quarantine. And next month they're having a training program on this, uh, ASPM 38 at Hyderabad. The NIPHM is organizing it. Uh, that's all for, as of now from India. Okay, thank you for that. And I think that's a, a good example of um, a few seed associations and in, in each one at a different stage in the, the implementation of, of ISPM 38, from just bringing awareness to the, to the standard to already having uh, initial meetings with the NPPOs and identifying uh, different areas of topic. So I think that's where we want to, to get and, and move forward towards. Uh, one more question for the, the panelists, um, and then if we have time, I don't know, I'll go after this, this next one, but um, I'd like to get an understanding of, of how APSA can support uh, each of your seed associations in the, in the next steps. Um, it sounds like each of you are at a, at a, at a different area or, or timing of your, your work on, on ISPM 38, so, so how could APSA assist in your, your ISPM uh, outreach? And maybe uh, Dr. Romero will start at the end again with you and work our way down just as we, we had previously. Uh, thanks, Dennis. Uh, for the Philippines, PSIA is an official member of the Seed Council of the, the government uh, under the Department of Agriculture. And it is given speaking opportunities uh, during its uh, seed summits or fora. That's why uh, uh, PSIA has this uh, leverage to work on. And, um, ISPM 38 can be included in these meetings to highlight its importance and prompt government to comply. Okay. So right now, uh, in our recent uh, dialogue with, um, with the NPPO, it is actually the National Plan Quarantine Service of uh, the Department of Agriculture. There, there has been uh, a re recent change in the leadership in that agency, but uh, the new head of NPQS has already assigned a focal person to study ISPM 38 and draft local guidelines aligned with ISPM 38. So there is some progress there on the regulatory side. Um, as to how APSA can assist PSIA, I think uh, it is important of, to invite uh, people from N NPPO, from NPQ, NPQS, who are really working on the PRA. Uh, 
there has been there there have been uh, changes in the staff of uh, that of uh, the agency, but we need to to en engage constant people so that knowledge will be retained, even if if there are changes. Uh, so, well, what I can see where APSA and IS ISF can directly help the Philippines on the regulate, regulatory side would be to provide expert advice on how to localize the ISPM 38, how to make it a uh, local policy because that's where uh, the work now is, is going on in the Philippines. Thank you. Okay, uh, no problem. Um, Mr. Fukuda, Fukuda, if you have any uh, ideas on how APSA might support your, your seed association? I, I'd like to talk about experience of JASTA on collaboration with the Japanese government. Uh, at first, JASTA corrected difficulties which member companies faced in their export of seed then explain them to MAF officials in meetings. Uh, MAF persons did not recognize so well about seed companies' difficulties to export seed. Then MAF examined the difficulties in detail. They divided them into things which should be solved by MAF and things which is settled by effort of our association side and explain them to just the members in the following meeting. I think it is basically important to deal concrete problems in this way and I think that it is useful to push forward the communication between seed association and NPPO. And I don't have a concrete idea at present about the uh, APSA support to seed association, but APSA may support seed industry of each country by collecting information and uh, holding meetings such as uh, white sanitary expert consultation. In addition, it will be uh, necessary to strengthen cooperation with ISF. And uh, at last, I have a question. How we should take, uh, take action in conjunction with the WTO-SPS agreement in cooperation with ISF or APSA? Okay. Thank you for that, Mr. Fukuda. And Mr. Reddy, uh, yeah. do you have any uh, suggestions? <coughs> the possible association of uh, APSA is, uh, I suggest, we'll have a uh, uh, collaboration with NIPHM, which is the only institute in India, uh, for training in uh, ISPM 38, and also the APSA can help uh, with NIPHM such as seed health testing, including weed uh, seed identification. And we had a discussion uh, with the uh, Director General of NIPHM. Uh, she uh, agreed already if APSA comes forward and they can uh, uh, have a collaboration on the government of it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Reddy. Um, how much time do we have left? You okay. have uh, 15 minutes. Okay, I think uh, before I summarize, uh, uh, we can open up the floor if anybody has any questions for the, the panelists. I'm Arvind Kapoor from India. Uh, you know, in vegetable seeds, uh, the uh, seed movement is happening multiple times. You know, production happens at uh, one place. 
the uh, uh, bulk is sold at other place and packed at third place and dispatched at fourth place. So when you have multiple of these things, uh, then under ICPM 38, uh, what EPSA can suggest that you know how the, uh, the, 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 the real measures can be taken so that we capture the right uh, if there's a seed born or seed transmitted pest at one place because the requirement of phytosanitaries are different based on the diseases. So the PRAs are done differently. So I think in this complexity, how we as a, as a EPSA can help, uh, you know, in, in particularly EPSA countries where these things are moving so, so frequently, that's sometimes very difficult to get even uh, that know that where the seed is produced and how many seed is moved from one country to another. <coughs> Who is willing to answer in the in the panel? Who are you addressing? What's your question for a particular uh, member in the in the panel? Mm -hmm. So uh, I have read through that, but I, I think these kind of complexities are to be decided by, by, the, by the seed companies. What kind of exp, uh, the explanation or the certificates they want to uh, disclose? Because here disclosure is more important. OK. Is this a, is this a comment or a, or a question? Well, both. OK. Um, so if I, if I understand correctly, and, and please correct me otherwise, but uh, I think you're looking for uh, the ability to, to perhaps share information for, from uh, PRAs more readily across the companies? Yeah. Okay. So we'll take note of that and maybe that's something that uh, the APSA will, will think about and how to, how to foster something like that. Um, a, comment, a question here in front. My name is uh, Rob Keen. I am from Enzesaden in uh, the Netherlands. Um, just something I picked up uh, during this year, and particularly from the um, phytosanitary workshop organised by the APSA, was uh, you have um, a number of different ISPMs, which uh, from which you can pick and choose, uh, or the MPPOs can pick and choose to apply the rules and regulations for moving seed around. And most of the uh, points made in those individual ISPMs are also enshrined in the new ISPM 38. Um, and I think one of the tasks that we have is uh, trying to um, uh, move the uh, MPPOs from using all those different ISPMs to realizing they can find everything in the ISPM 38. Um, is that something you can, uh, can also see? Or is it just my interpretation of what I picked up? Maybe I can ask uh, Mr. Reddy to give an answer to that from the Indian perspective. I think we need to uh, have a discussion on that uh, within the industry. There is a difference of opinions. The government, uh, we are trying to tell our views, but they have their own. I think it is in a still initial stage, sir. And if I, if I comment on that one for you, Rob, um, I think the, the NPPOs are very familiar with the existing NPPOs. And I think the opportunity for the seed industry is to not only become really familiar with ISPM 38, but as well as those initial ISPMs. And if the seed industry is able to effectively draw the connections from the existing ISPMs that the NPPOs are familiar with and connect those dots to the ISPM 38. So bring them from what they're used to doing, connect the dots to the new standard, and then I think there you can really drive home the messages and, and communicate effectively with the NPPOs. Yeah, that's, uh, that's essentially the uh, point I picked up uh, this year. And uh, with respect to uh, the task of uh, APSA with this, that could be something they could be involved in to help the, reg the national associations uh, more effectively promote the use of the ISPM 38 at their local level. 
Great suggestion. Thank you, Rob. Do we have any other questions from the floor up here in front? So my name is Wei Hongtian. I come from uh, China National Sea Trade Association. I just want to uh, add some comments to Mr. Zhang. Uh, because uh, in China, as, as, as you may know, there is a two uh, uh, seas association, China National Seas Association and the China National Sea Trade Association. So as, uh, as a China National Sea Trade Association, uh, because uh, most of our members uh, do the import and export seats, so uh, we talk about our awareness of the ISPM 38, we are sent uh, after the ISPM 38 uh, adopted in April 2017, we uh, uh, sent the documents, okay, to our members. When the Chinese version available, we send the uh, Chinese uh, menu, uh, training menu to our members, to uh, member companies, to increase the awareness where what, what happened in the international standard. Uh, second thing, uh, for SINSTA, we have, uh, we had a meeting with AQSIQ. Uh, AQSIQ is uh, our China NPPO, okay? So we uh, talk about uh, uh, ISPM 38. They already aware uh, the uh, the new uh, version 38, uh, and they are have uh, uh, they told us uh, uh, they have uh, internal discussions how to you know, uh, adopt uh, uh, 38. Uh, at the same time, uh, because China uh, for the final century issues, there are two departments involved in this. One is AQSAQ, which is uh, China NPPO. Another, another is the final century, we call it division or department and the MOA. So we also uh, have a meeting with the uh, final century uh, division of MOA. They also have awareness of that. So uh, what I'm thinking is um, next step. Uh, they are uh, the important for for China is uh, personal opinion is to uni uh, uh, unionization. Okay, to harmonize of the. Uh, phytosanitary measures between two departments inside of China. And then we talk about how to harmonize the phytosanitary measures under the ISPM 38 in the whole Asia uh, Pacific region. Okay, so next step, uh, next step I think uh, for the uh, China National State Association, both associations, we uh, after we have meeting with MPPO and uh, MOA, Federal Center uh, Division, uh, we can provide trainings to our uh, member, uh, to our uh, sales companies. That's uh, uh, my comment. Thank you. And I, I think that's an excellent uh, uh, comment. Um, and, it, and it's very much a best practice, I believe. Uh, sharing the, the ISPM in the local language with your membership is great, as well as uh, having those, those meetings set up with uh, the government agencies that are appropriate, and then, and then excellent. You know, the next step is the further training for, for members. So I think that's, that's great, and that's something we want to target in all, all of the, the, uh, the countries. So great point. Dennis, can I ask you to make the summary then of the, yes. the panel? Okay. so. I, I think what, that what we learned today is that uh, at the various seed associations are, are at very different levels of, of outreach with the ISPM 38 and, and bringing awareness to their membership. Some have even already contacted their, their NPPOs with, with meetings, so I, I think that's great. Um, as far as uh, activities for, for APSA that they, they might take up in the, in the future, things suggested today are to uh, invite NPPOs. And, and really get engaged those that are working specifically on the PRAs. Um, also to, to help provide experts uh, to provide advice on how to, to localize the ISPM 38. Uh, how do we bring it to a local level where there's local challenges and, and interpret it that way. Uh, also to foster coordination between uh, NPPOs and the National Seed Associations and help coordinate meetings and, and share information. Um, and then help to provide training on ISPM 38 
as well as on seat health testing is something I heard. Um, there's also a desire to, to compile PRA information uh, across the, the APSA membership. And then also, if there's an ability to, to assist with these communications between NPPOs and the National Seed Associations, it's how do we connect the old ISPMs that the, the NPPOs are familiar with to the new ISPM 38 to drive more of that connection to, to ISPM 38. So um, I, I think that covers it, and uh, thank you, Anka. Thank you, uh, Dennis, and thank you, panelists. So I think you need a, a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, uh, I would like to go to the next agenda item and I would like uh, to ask you, uh, Dr. Datlani, to take the floor and give us an update on the third APSA phytosanitary expert consultation. Thanks. Thank you, Anke. Uh, It's nice that I'm presenting a report about the third APSA phytosanitary expert consultation which we held uh, this summer uh, because uh, that is uh, the APSA's initiative to address those phytosanitary issues in the region. How do we harmonize them to improve the trade uh, in the region and from the region? And uh, ISPM 38 is one of the major agenda, which was the, one of the major agenda in this particular uh, meeting which we had. This third phytosanitary expert consultation uh, was on phytosanitary collaboration in the Asia-Pacific region, held in June. The focus of the meeting was, uh, as I mentioned in the title, that was the phytosanitary collaboration. How do we engage? Uh, with the government people in the region to uh, engage, engagement between the industry and the um, NPPOs, which is the government uh, bodies uh, connected with this, to discuss issues related to movement of seats across the borders and develop a framework for collaboration for mutual benefits. What we realized was that uh, there was always a kind of a mistrust uh, in the mind of uh, the government whenever we, whenever the industry took certain issues to them. So, uh, and uh, they never looked at it from an angle of uh, working together uh, to resolve any issue. So, we started this exercise in 2015 and this was the third one which we had this year. 2015, uh, they just warmed up uh, the NPPOs, they just warmed up uh, to the industry in the region. And um, we initially, in that particular meeting, we tried to uh, create more awareness about what the industry by itself is doing for uh, producing and maintaining the quality of the seed, particularly related to the seed health issues. and. Uh, um, they were surprised that we take so much of care in the production of the seeds ourselves. So, and their role is only to facilitate the trade. And uh, they did realize that some of the requirements which they put in, or some of the uh, regulatory um, things are there, they have been there for a long time and they have not had to change. They were also not very clearly aware about the changes which are coming about uh, in the industry's requirements. Uh, in this particular meeting, we had the NPPOs from the 10 countries, Australia, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Japan, Nepal, New Zealand, Pakistan, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. There were two last minute dropouts. Malaysia dropped out at the last moment, and so did uh, China. China was an important country which we missed in this particular meeting. Uh, but one of the, our, we, we were very uh, unfortunate that in none of these three meetings, 
we could get the NPPO from India uh, because uh, what we realized that, that there is a lot of trade with India and from India in the region. And, but then the, his participation, the person from India could not participate. See, when we talk about the NPPOs, it was raised that we need to invite the right person from a country. But then what happens is the government uh, has its own policy of nominating the person who will attend such meetings. First of all, uh, it was very difficult to, for our APSA for us to convince the government to send somebody there because they are not very keen on attending uh, meetings with the private bodies like, uh, with the industry bodies like APSA. But once they understood that we can work uh, closely together, they started coming. And uh, now we are faced with this problem that most of these government officials are permitted only two visits uh, abroad in a year. And one of them is always to the CPM meeting in IPPC. So the second meeting, they always have to prioritize whether they can come. So most of the time, they, uh, we get landed with somebody who may not be the right person. But we have been fortunate that uh, in the three meetings, we have had a very good representation of those people and they have uh, worked with us very closely. Uh, in this particular thir third meeting, uh, the industry was represented mainly by the National Seed Associations. National Seed Associations from uh, Australia, from Hong Kong, from Philippines, uh, Thasta, that is Thailand, uh, they were represented. In addition to them, we also had a representation from ISF, Dennis was there, uh, and then um, from the Crop Life Asia and uh, ASTA, uh, uh, Tom Murray, because ASTA is our member and we realize that they are also doing a lot of work uh, in their own region, in the North American region, related to harmonization of phytosanitary regulatory measures. So uh, their participation has always been very, very helpful to us. And of course, Windrock International, uh, they are now getting into this uh, space and um, we were very happy that they could bring in those uh, participants, the NPPOs from Bangladesh, Nepal and Cambodia. Uh, from, uh, this was the APSA team which was there, the Trade and Marketing Committee basically and uh, our own Secretariat. Uh, these were the resource persons who spoke on different aspects uh, from ISF, uh, Francois from uh, Guinness, and then we had the NPPOs from Philippines, Australia, New Zealand. And these three uh, people, uh, persons, shared as to what is the existing um, structure for the collaboration which they already have. When the government is collaborating with the, or partnering, the industry is partnering the government in various phytosanitary uh, processes. And uh, Tassani from Thailand, she also made a presentation on the regional uh, proposal which they have. Uh, and Tom Murray, of course, from uh, North America. And Rob Keane, of course, uh, uh, he brought in a lot of experience of his uh, groups working in ISF, plus uh, the industry's perspective. But the main consultation agenda was the program included, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the available modules for the government industry partnership in addressing and designing the phytosanitary regulatory policy. And the presentation on a regional proposal for phytosanitary harmonization, which was made by the lady from Thailand, and details of the recently approved ISPM on the uh, International Movement of Seed, that was ISPM 38. And uh, we had a a big discussion after Dennis could introduce the uh, ISPM 38 and then we discussed briefly in that particular meeting in June as to how do we engage with the government because implementation is always with the government and the industry has no other role. We cannot neither uh, pressurize them or something but the only thing is that the industry has to bring it to the notice of the IS, uh, NPPOs that ISPM 38 now kind of encompasses 
the other ISPMs which have been there. And if they just work with ISPM 38, that will facilitate a lot of uh, things related to phytosanitary uh, harmonization. <laughs> and uh, the NSAs uh, can work with the government in, ad in not in addition to, but then instead of the each industry player going to the government and working with them. Uh, Dr. Nasir Mahmood, he was there at our first meeting and he was there at this particular meeting also. And uh, he was uh, the first one to share about the phyto harmonization examples of the industry government collaboration from Australia. And one of the things which we realized that Australia is a, uh, their seed division in the NPPO is uh, quite resourceful and they have good resources available to them. So they are already doing a lot of work and they are developing some PRAs, uh, uh, um, commodity-wise, four commodity groups, PRAs, they are developing. And they said that they will be very happy if there are some bilateral uh, relations or bilateral exchanges of, uh, this, so that it facilitates the other nations which, we do, which do not have that kind of resources available to them to develop their own PRAs to be uh, assisted by the one group in Australia. New Zealand is uh, another example where uh, they have been working with the industry in the past and uh, they said that uh, ISPM 38 particularly is something in which they would like to work together uh, so that they can um, take the agenda forward. And same in uh, Philippines. Uh, Philippines earlier was not doing it, but we were told that after our second phytosanitary meeting expert consultation which we had in 2016, September, and then they also started working with the uh, industry and uh, they had made some initial uh, moves then engaging with the industry, but then uh, over the period of last one year, they have uh, brought in a lot of uh, engagement with the industry in this regard. Uh, Mr. Franchua, uh, from uh, Guinness, he, he uh, could share about the French implementation of the European phytosanitary regulations. Uh, how does the private sector get involved in uh, doing this? And that kind of an example uh, from Europe, which has got a very matured seed industry, was extremely helpful in our discussions. Tom Moore, as I said, uh, brought in the um, uh, uh, experiences from uh, North America and uh, Tom Moore fortunately had been with us at all the three meetings and uh, over the three meetings he himself has been able to understand as to what the other uh, NPPOs in the region how they are doing and how uh, the ASTAS experience uh, can help them. Ms. Thassani she uh, had developed Okay, she had developed a proposal for developing the ACCPC regional standard for phytosanitary measures on seed health certification, and she presented it uh, to the group, and we discussed as to how do we work with ACCPC on this thing. Dennis Johnson, as I said, that he gave an ISPM updates, and then what are the next steps which we move forward to. Uh, we all these discussions, which all these presentations, which we had on day one, were discussed in a round table with Rob Keane, uh, leading the um, discussions. He was the moderator, and we had uh, we could bring out a uh, lot of uh, synergies in the group and a lot of kind of a harmony in our thinking between the government and the industry. Now, uh, there are a few recommendations which emerged. The main thing which was that everybody appreciated that this uh, platform, the APSHA initiative, expert consultations have become a good platform for engaging with the uh, government, and we should continue uh, this kind of an exercise. Uh, there were discussions about developing a regional pest list, but uh, it was thought that rather than developing a separate new pest list, using the ISF pest list as a starting point and also taking the help of the CABI list, we must develop a common pest list for the 
trade in the region. Basically, uh, it will be uh, country-wise, and then if each country uses this ISF uh, source, uh, that will be helpful to things. And ISPM 38 is an important instrument uh, for harmonization, and that should be, uh, uh, we should be working very closely uh, with the NPPOs, and that's, uh, we could realize in the discussion just before this. And all PRAs done by a country should be posted on their website for information and guidance of the industry. Also, new PRAs should be shared with other nations to avoid duplication of efforts. As I mentioned about the Australian thing, they have developed a lot of PRAs and they are willing to share with uh, the others so that they develop their own PRAs based on the exercise which has already been done. And APSA uh, was uh, very keen to support this kind of a exercise. And APSA, it was suggested that, recommended that APSA should organize training programs on subjects like detection method, equivalence, and other emerging issues for capacity building of NPP officials. And just now we had the uh, suggestion that the government officials also need to be uh, kind of a, uh, trained on uh, the various aspects of ISPM 38, how do they go about implementing it. And this is what we uh, also recommended, that an APSA would be uh, working with them. And APSA and the seed-specific resource-rich NPPOs like Australia, New Zealand, and others, they should consider supporting um, uniform database development by arranging translation of existing uh, databases into English language. Because uh, in most of the countries, they said that our website is in our local language, which sometimes becomes difficult for other people to uh, access and understand. So APSA was willing to support uh, translating those websites into English language so that the members from the other nations can also uh, use those facilities. Uh, as it happens in most of the meetings, and there were a lot of discussions off the table, and that really helped in understanding certain nuances about the subject. And I also realized that the evening wrap-up discussions uh, over a glass of wine really helped because the people were relaxed. And then uh, uh, nobody was an NPPO or so nobody was industry. We were sitting together and discussing a subject which was of common interest. This was the group uh, which we had. And uh, we were very, very uh, happy that uh, most of the people were uh, feeling that uh, we are doing some good work uh, together and this kind of an exercise should uh, continue. And the last message which we got from this uh, expert consultation was that it is a good work which you are doing and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dadlani. Uh, due to time, I would uh, do not any further questions at this moment. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, because uh, we are running out a little bit of time, and uh, we may have to look at the consequences of this meeting for our future activities, because uh, that is the next uh, agenda item, planning of the activities of this standing committee. and. Um, I think um, I, I luckily had Dr. Darlani here giving me some notes on what the plans are and uh, yeah, what we already started this morning of, uh, with, uh, this, or this afternoon this, with the session, it's trade and all those phyto issues. So there are a couple of study tours planned. Uh, there is a study tours for business development proposed for Bangladesh and Kyrgyzstan in 2018. So some actions can be initiated uh, with the national seat associations to really develop that. So that is one suggestion. A st study tour to Australia was already planned for, but had to be postponed. And uh, now will be uh, worked at, at um, um, with the uh, SIG on cover crops. So uh, soon after the ISF Congress, you will hear more about it. Then um, 
there is a seed uh, trade manual where we have been working on and have been thinking um, about um, the EC of APSA has agreed not to further work at this moment on a street trade manual. They thought it was not the best uh, effort and time to spend uh, their work on, on this item. So for now, uh, it's, it's uh, suggested not to further work on it unless better proposals come. And then I think in follow-up of the activities of uh, the third meeting on the phytosanitary expert consultation, it's important to keep momentum and go and organize a fourth one. And I, I think we got already several topics that should be or could be dealt with in this fourth one. And the one that I uh, thought was very uh, eminent here is the one to focus on a transi transition from the current S ISPMs to really starting using the ISPM 38. So these are the activities that are proposed from secretariat and the chair and co-chair. So I don't know, are there any ideas in the room for further work that people feel that should be done uh, by uh, APSA? Any reactions? Any things we should not do? Now, I, I suppose if there are no reactions that people agree with uh, this approach, so that will be the study tours and indeed uh, focus on the fourth uh, uh, meeting of the expert consultation group. So, do you want to add anything on that, uh, Dr. No. Dadlani? Okay. So, are there any questions left that people feel they need to raise before I'm going into a short summary? No? Okay, so I, I will keep the summary short. I think uh, we were looking at trading opportunities, in particular in this case in, in Thailand, but what uh, for me became very clear is that Trading opportun opportunities depend on climate for seed production. It depends on an infrastructure. It depends on human resources available. And of course, it uh, uh, depends a lot on the regulatory framework. And then especially looking at intellectual property, possibilities for plant breeding innovation, and phyto issues. We had, I think, a very good discussion, and I'm not going to repeat your summary, Dennis, on uh, ISPM 38. I think it's clear that uh, there is some awareness, but more awareness can be raised. Uh, training should be done, there should be coordination, and the role of APSA is really information sharing, including on P PRAs. So with that, um, I, I would almost like to close the session. As, as is usual in, in the APSA meetings, we would like to thank the speak, uh, speakers with a small token. So um, I think uh, we, we are going to call the speakers one by one to the podium uh, for, for uh, receiving this token. So can I start? Uh, you, you do it? Yes. Good. Thank you, Anke. Uh, as uh, Anke mentioned that uh, traditionally, just as a token of appreciation to the resource persons who have helped us in this particular session, we like to uh, give them a small uh, memento to carry back with them. Uh, and uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, invite John Christopher Gawach who is the president of International Seed Federation, to please come and do the honors for us. Thank you. And uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, request Anke van der Haak, the chairperson for this particular session, to please come and receive this thing. Again, 
Thank you, Anke, for accepting our request at the last moment to uh, do this work. Now, may I invite uh, David Kalacha? We began this session with a with an um, discourse on explaining what are the opportunities for seed sector in this country. <laughs> Dennis Johnson. Yes, and ready. Liang Jiang. Yeah, you need this one. <laughs> Not problem. Mr. Fukuda. And Mr. Gabriel Ortega. The two more. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anke. Thank you very much. So with that, the session is closed. Thank you very much.